The following is an analysis, interpretation, and summary of James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. Chapter 8. How to Make a Habit Irresistible. Law 2. Make it attractive. So now, coming on to the fourth law of behavior change, in the last three chapters, we talked about uh, law one, which is the cue phase of behavior. So when we're initially cued, we want to make the cue obvious if it's a constructive habit or make it invisible if it's a destructive habit that we want to change or eliminate or mitigate. So now we're on to law two, make it attractive. So we're going to start with the dopamine-driven feedback loop. Habits are dopamine-driven feedback loops. The average slot machine player will spin the wheel 600 times per hour. Why are they doing this? There is obviously some type of neurophysiological endocrine response that is occurring to get us back to override our logic to continue to spin that wheel. And this is expressed in not just gambling, but a whole myriad of different habits. Dopamine is released not only on well, when you experience pleasure, but also when you anticipate it. The prediction and anticipation of reward, that term that Dr. Andrew Huberman terms that you're on the right path, right? See, people get dopamine like mixed up. It's just a reward pleasure pathway, but it's actually a pathway that is triggered for when you feel like you're on the right path, that causes a dopamine spike and triggers a motivation to act. And it is the anticipation of the reward that gets us to take action. And to take now a little detour onto some of Dr. Andrew Huberman's uh, theories or, or research is this is why he talks about to not the danger of hyping things up. Like, and anticipating things too much can actually mitigate the experience of experiencing the pleasure of the actual thing you're anticipating. So there is this phenomena called the anticipation and dopamine reward prediction error. And what that means is there is a degree to which something feels good. It's going to depend on how much dopamine you received before in anticipation for the event. Example, we go to a restaurant. I might hype it up how amazing it's going to be and how good the steak is going to be. So there's a high probability that that experience of food is now not going to be as good for you because for you to actually experience that experience to the level it was anticipated, the dopamine release during the event would have to exceed the dopamine release experienced in anticipation for the event. This is the prediction error that can occur when our excitement and anticipation and looking forward to things can actually be a more dopaminergic, pleasurable experience than the actual event, which is quite remarkable, I think, because now there is a... This is how we can now manage our expectations and anticipation and excitement if we want to experience events to a greater height or, you know, a greater sense of excitement or dopamine, dopaminogenic feeling. So there's, there's, there's like this counterintuitive mechanism to actually uh, anticipating events with a lot of excitement. And so surprises, this is why like people, a lot of people love surprises, why surprises can feel so good to some people because there was no anticipation. In fact, that event that they experienced, there was no context in the anticipation previously to trigger dopamine for them to compare the anticipation versus the actual event. And so that surprise is often this hugely dopaminergic, uh, pleasurable experience, at least from like a neurochemical perspective. So maybe we should all stay a little, a little more even keel when we talk about things we're going to do in the future and just wait for them to occur instead of hyping them up because you can actually detrimentally affect, you know, the experience in of itself. So the reward system activated in your brain when you receive a reward is the same system that is activated when you anticipate a reward, right? This is how this works. This is why anticipation and reward and events uh, 
can occur in this way where you have this error of uh, inconsistency. And the example of, of this that everybody kind of knows is anticipating you know, Christmas morning or a trip you're taking can feel better than the actual morning itself. This describes the difference between wanting and liking. You see, the brain has more neural structures allocated for the feeling of wanting rewards than for liking them. We have the wanting structures like the brainstem, the nucleus accumbens, the eventual uh, tegmendal, the dorsal striatum, the amygdala, the prefrontal cortex. And the liking structures are much smaller and referred to as hedonic hotspots throughout the brain. Example would be, you know, 100% of the nucleus accumbens is activated during wanting, but only 10% of the structure is activated during liking. You know, I heard, I think I was watching the, the show uh, Westworld, which is an inc one of the most incredible sci-fi future, futuristic shows that I've seen. So she references that the nucleus accumbens is the structure of part of our brain that has evolved to of believe in God or believe in a higher power. And, th and th that, I mean, I don't know the veracity of that statement, you know. However, it makes sense because that is a wanting in of itself to believe in something bigger than yourself. That is not so much a liking, that is more of a wanting. So the brain allocates more resources for craving, desire, wanting than actual liking and this makes sense from an evolutionary perspective because in order to survive and reproduce we need a strong physiological desire to take action in order to survive and reproduce but now 21st century we've dulled a lot of these functions and will replace them with destructive addictions this is why we need to make our habits more attractive because it is the ex expectation of a rewarding experience that motivates to act in the first place so we almost have to hack our own physiology knowing that we have more uh, brain structures for wanting, liking, and craving than we do, or sorry, wanting, anticipating, not liking. We have less uh, brain structures uh, responsible so far that we know of for liking. And this explains why the anticipation can be a more uh, thrilling feeling than the actual event. Now let's move on to the last component of this chapter, how to use temptation bundling to ha make habits more attractive, because that's essentially what we're trying to do. We're trying to make the habit attractive. So temptation bundling is linking an action you want to do with an action you need to do. Want and need. The ABC Network created, thank God it's Tuesday, where they'd air three back-to-back -back shows in the evening and marketed it to viewers as a night they could relax, drink wine, and enjoy some comfort food. So they associated the thing they needed viewers to do, watch their shows, with activities the viewers already wanted to do. Relax, drink wine, eat popcorn. So people made the association with their Tuesday nights now with watching ABC and feeling relaxed and enjoying some good food and being entertained. So the reward gets associated with the cue and the habit of turning on the TV on Thursday or oh, Tuesday nights becomes attractive because of what else is it associated with? It was associated with that. So this habit bundling, like how can we associate our primitive instincts and habits with something we need to do? Something we know is good for us, but we're noticing is difficult for us to actually do. The lesson is you're more likely to find a behavior attractive if you get to do one of your favorite things at the same time. AKA, more probable behaviors will reinforce less probable behaviors. So find your most probable behaviors, find your least probable behaviors that you know you need and want to do to build yourself, and attach them together. You know, for example, one I do is I will walk and I'll couple walking with work. So after every training session currently, 
I, I will cool down, I'll breathe, I'll walk on the treadmill. I, I will never typically, I don't walk on a treadmill, walk outside, typically just doing that task alone. And what I'll do is, well, I'll couple that task, how habit stack that task with other tasks I know I need to get done. You know, communication work, uh, admin work, um, general uh, writing, reading, researching, etc., etc. social media, like, and so now I've coupled these two needs and wants, or you could even argue, you know, they're both needs in a way to be more active, get some energy expenditure, cool down, and with another task, so I can kind of double my productivity, quote unquote, making me feel like I am ticking multiple boxes at once instead of what most people do is they will just plop themselves down on a chair and do the one task. Well, what if you could habit stack the task and do a task you want to do with a task you need to do? And suddenly we're more efficient this way and we're able to progress further forward in the same time, same time span. Let's go through some other examples you might, people might be able to relate to. You might enjoy watching Netflix, but you want to exercise consistently. So you make a deal with yourself that you can only watch Netflix when you're exercising on your cardio machine in front of your TV. Okay, you enjoy reading, but you want to exercise or vice versa. Well, you can only read and exercise when you're, when you're exercising or listening to an audiobook. So you associate those two. You enjoy evening TV, but you need to stretch. So you stretch while you watch TV. You like to eat, but you don't like to read, okay? Or what if you read and eat at the same time? You like to listen to music and podcasts, but don't like to do mundane admin work. Do them both at the same time. That's what I do. So you habit stack and you put temptation bundlings together. That's that's the major, when you can do that, that's where a lot of the magic happens, where you're running downhill instead of uphill. Things get easier. How to make that's how we make habits more irresistible. We almost like crave the habit now because we get to do something we like and want with something we know we need to do. And so an example of that habit stack temptation bundling is you might pull out your phone, and that's the cue. After you pull out your phone and do what you have to do, you do 10 push-ups. Or after and then after I do 10 push-ups, I'm gonna check social media. It's like there's this want, need, temptation bundling. So we're associating doing the things we need to do with the things we want to do. That's the crux of this chapter. Think about in our lives how, I gave the example of myself, but how we can couple tasks together. Like you will almost never catch me sitting down and just watching, uh, you know, the entertainment that I really love to watch that is like my drugs is like a really great cinematic experience or movie and television show like uh you almost will never catch me just doing that what i do it with is something i need so that's the want right you know you could spend all day doing that that thing right it's very dopamogenic it's like hedonistic it's you know it's pleasurable but what i do is i couple it with a need I, i need to eat and eating can take you know some time, particularly when you have to ingest a lot of food because, you know, you have a high energy uh, high energy output, whatever the case may be. And sometimes your eating might go for 30, 40, 50 minutes over, a, you know, a one, two course, three course type of sitting. So suddenly, now you've coupled, well, maybe you can't justify just sitting there alone doing that activity. Well, what if you coupled it with something you need to do like eating? Well, you need to eat. So you can stare at a wall, breathe and meditate, reflect, you can read, you can watch something that you want to watch, whatever combination of activities works for you in your individual life. That's how I justify those things because I couple the need and want together because I can't currently justify just sitting there passively watching it. That's That, that to me is more of a misuse of my time. But if I couple those two together, it's much more uh, logically justifiable for me personally. 
So don't go comparing yourself to me. Better, worse, oh, he does that, she does that. Forget that. Use the principles of coupling the wants and needs together so then you can be more ultimately productive and time effective. So that is how you make a habit irresistible. One, understanding the dopamine anticipation feedback loops of anticipation and experience and then temptation bundling and uh, habit stacking together with the want and need, things you want and need to do. So next chapter, we're going to talk about the role of family and friends in shaping your habits, which if not is already up, will be up very soon on all podcast platforms, YouTube, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram. I put snippets up all at Alexander Emanuel if you want to see that. I've got book summaries on all different types of incredible, profound books on this channel. Dear Alexander memoirs that I kind of self-reflective pieces that I write as well. And if you guys want to see the transcribed versions of these, you prefer to read, you can go to medium.com to search my name or on my website, alexanderemanuel.com. All the links below. Hit the notifications if you want to keep seeing these or subscribe if you want to keep seeing these. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you.